On today's episode, we're going to be talking about something that was touched upon a little bit in the last episode, and that is learning to survive as an artist. And this is going to talk about jobs, finances, mental health, physical health, all that stuff that goes into what it takes to sur- survive, quite literally, um, if you're an actor, voice actor, dancer, musician, artist, director, producer, because especially starting out, it is very hard to make a livable wage that is sustained only by doing that. A lot of people have survival jobs. And I think there is an illusion that most people who are working even somewhat at a recognizable level are extremely rich and financially well off. That is so not the case. I still struggle as somebody who is a very consistent working voice actor, on-camera actor, theater. I've worked in all these different spaces, commercially, whatever. It is extremely hard to make a living as a performer, as an artist, and I hope that a little bit of my insight can help you understand what it's like to pay your bills as an artist and some things that you can do or things you can consider to make your pursuit as an artist a little bit more satisfying or beneficial to you in the long run. So strap in and enjoy. If you're an artist of any kind, it's probably no surprise that starting out and even in kind of the thick of the career until you've had some sort of explosion where you have created some sort of celebrity status or you are working consistently or you landed a really high profile job, that it is hard to pay your bills or have an income that is sustainable or is recurring, something you can depend on and rely on so that every month you're not worrying if there is a bill or any sort of financial commitment you have to be worried about. Being an actor myself, voice acting, doing on camera, theater, the various different things that I can do, there is still very little job security. It allows for a career that can create a lot of stress, anxiety, depression, all of the mental health ailments that we try to remedy or seek counsel for because regardless of our talent, regardless of what we've done, our resume, there still might be reasons why we are not working, reasons completely out of our control. I'm a big advocate for creating your own work, but even still, like if you were to say today to somebody like, yeah, go ahead and make your own work, and that's a great way of taking your career into your own hands, that can still take a very long time to create the traction and then to be able to monetize your own work, whether that's selling a script, getting views on YouTube, you know, creating a Patreon, whatever it might be, those are still things that take a lot of time, curating an audience, and then being able to convert that audience into paying customers or at least people who are subscribing to you in some sort of monetary way. I've talked a lot about my history and my financial circumstances in this career, but I'll give you another quick rundown. I don't come from a money background at all. My family was not wealthy at all. We actually were, we were like uh, middle class poor is a great way of putting it. Like my family, my dad made enough money where we could be considered like lower middle class, but because of the debt that they have accrued, we were poor. Like we, it was all credit card money that allowed us to live in the neighborhood that we lived and to afford a house and all of these various things. It wasn't like we had this money. You know, my parents are still in debt. My mom is still dealing with tremendous amounts of debt. And for me, that meant... I was going to have to figure out my own way of going to college because they made too much money for me to get financial aid, but they didn't make enough money to be able to help me. So since the age of 13, I have been working because my parents really couldn't afford to get me things. I I remember distinctly, uh, I mean, they, they tried really hard to get me the things that I wanted, but a very fond memory I have for, I don't know if it's fond, it's just stuck with me. And I think some of you all here will appreciate it is. When I was, however old, Kingdom Hearts 1 or 2 came out, I can't remember, and I'm I'm in Costco with my dad, and it was back when in Costco, the games were just like out in like these open sections, and I put it in the, the cart, and he didn't notice, 
And then we got to the register and I kind of just snuck it on there and he wound up paying for it and didn't realize it. And then when we were like going through the store, he was like, what the heck is this? I think my dad did notice it and he felt so bad that I wanted this to do that, to have gone that far that maybe he even just kind of like had to let me know like that was, it was messed up that I did that, but he felt so bad for me that I wanted something that he got it for me. Um, you know, th- that it was like a huge deal when we got an, an above ground pool. Like we wanted it so bad and we, you know, couldn't afford an in ground pool like anybody else. But to get an above ground pool was like a huge deal for our family uh, when that happened. I, I, I just didn't have a lot of money growing up. Things were not easily given to me. My first car, I had to take out a personal loan and it took me a very long time to pay that off. So since 13, I was working at a, a gym, making five twenty-five an hour, cleaning the machines and basically just doing it for the gym membership because I couldn't afford it. So I'd make $15.75 a day and then I'd go to the gym <laughs> afterwards. So my checks would be like 45 bucks because I only worked like three days a week or four days a week. So I kind of had that mentality ever since I was a kid that I had to work to make money and to get the things that I wanted. So going into college, I took out a lot of loans, uh, didn't get a lot of student aid. I had to take private loans out and get co-signed from, you know, my mom, my grandma, and I'm still paying these loans back. And I've, I've been chasing that ghost ever since I've went to college. But meanwhile, I'm in school. I knew I couldn't just not work, you know, so I was, I worked as, you know, various jobs I've had here. I was a bus boy. I worked at Target. I, I did... Uh, pizza delivery. I worked as a custodian in a in a housing unit. I eventually, when I was in New York, I would start doing like odd job type scenario things where I was uh, handing out flyers or like being a medical patient for medical students uh, for them to try out like different scenarios. I would do like street team campaigns for certain companies. Um, just anything I could really do to make money on a consistent basis and enough that it was going to make a difference too. like the street team stuff. Thankfully it paid like 25 bucks an hour at the time. And I was like, that's a huge amount of money, but it wasn't consistent. So I had to just find out whatever I would do. I would do, um, focus groups. <laughs> I would just pretend that I knew what they were asking for. I would just, I remember I went to one for people who smoked marijuana and I had never smoked marijuana. I still have not ever smoked marijuana and I just pretended like I did. And uh, that's the type of hustle mentality that I had. Because living in New York City, I, I, for me to pursue my art form, and that's why I'm speaking to you all as primarily probably artists here. A lot of people listen to this podcast are artists. When I um, went to college in Jersey first, and then I had moved to New York, both of those scenarios, because I went to NYU, I knew I couldn't live home. Because it was a very hostile envir- environment. Just a lot of contention between my parents and my, my siblings. It just wasn't a really great place for me to learn vulnerability. <laughs> and that wasn't going to be the place for me to learn how to cry and feel comfortable about it. And deconstruct all of like these masculine ideals I thought I needed to have. So I had to live outside of my house to, exp- to, to pursue this art form. And the first... I, I did student housing in, in uh, Monmouth University all the times that I was there. I eventually got a home with a couple of guys. We, I think, paid like 500 bucks each. And then when I went to NYU, I did student housing for the first couple of months and realized it was like $1,800. And I was like, I can, there's no way I'm going to be able to afford this. Like, just the idea of it, thinking about that, how much I would be doing it. I'm like, no, this is a ripoff. And I wound up moving out and still getting an apartment, which was $1,100. And I lived with seven other people in Chinatown. And all of these financial commitments, I still have my car payments, still paying other bills, phone bill, um, my own credit cards. Like, I just had so many bills and it was so hard to survive. And I'm in school. It was extremely stressful, and I really wish I knew more about therapy at the time to help me manage these things. Because I think I would have been a lot of be- a lot better off, uh, or able to have managed it a lot more effectively. But I wound up getting really lucky, and I wound up making my own business. And it, I, I credit a producing class that I had in NYU, and um, I had made like a, basically a pitch packet for a, a websites websites for art uh, for artists. 
I think it was called like something art websites. I can't remember really what it was, but I was focusing primarily on actors, uh, people who I was surrounding myself with, who all, all these people who I knew needed demo reels and, and websites and all of their, their marketing materials. I also did it for theater companies, for people just like a yoga studio did it for. I wound up making websites for people through Wix, which was a website building platform. So I was able to set my own rates. I was able to charge kind of a decent price because not many people were doing this at the time. You know, uh, I was really able to make good money in addition to everything else I was doing and uh, got lucky with making a small business because of the people who I knew and people who trusted me. I eventually moved into doing demo reels and making short films for people and then shooting commercials and commercial content for companies. I mean, even when I moved out to LA three years ago, I wound up getting a gig for the Gates Foundation to cover like a lot of the COVID um, scientific um, research foundation information. So I was still hustling even when I moved here. I had to figure out all that stuff. I'm giving you this long-winded explanation of my history because it was very difficult, even though I had already been working in theater, film, TV, voiceover. I mean, I was I was the voice of Nick Sports for, for years. And people think that as an actor, you're making this insane living. Talked about it on Danny's episode. That's kind of what the inception for this idea was. And it's really just not the case. Unless you are working on a TV series for multiple seasons, and then even still you have to consider your union dues, you're paying your agent fee, your manager fee, you're walking away with 60%, if that, at the end of production. So these SAG contracts... Most time, most of the times, they pay you on either a day rate or a weekly rate. I'm not going to be specific here. I might, we might uh, have to uh, pause for a second. But let's let's look at the SAG rates for voiceover real quick, and then we'll go into the SAG rates for um, on camera and all that stuff too. So it's all different because. Um, there's certain categories, but right here, the session fee for a commercial radio commercial is $316. Then they have various tag rates. They have network usage rates like buyouts. So like 13 week regional network use rate is $1,000. So somewhere for a really big commercial on the radio, you're making maybe, um, two grand. If that's a huge thing that they're buying a multi-week buyout, more often than not, these commercials you're making like 500 bucks. The same thing is for uh, broadcast television commercials, $535 for the session fee. Internet commercials, for four weeks, it's $669. One year, if they want to use it for a year, is $2,000. This is all based off the the 2019 rate guide. So actually, let's, let's pull up the more official rate guide here here we go commercial contracts dubbing rates is even uh, an even better one we can look at interactive rate here we go we found it an off-camera interactive which is video games um day performer up to three voices for a four-hour day is 956 dollars so you're basically making a thousand dollars for up to four hours on a video game per day, up to three voices. So a typical video game, if you're playing like a main character, you can do like uh, a week to two weeks, depends. Uh, For Neo, The World Ends With You, I think mine was like three or four weeks, so I did make a decent amount of money on that. But it's still only $1,000 per day, right? So if you're playing an ancillary character, like if you're doing a four-day session, you've made four thousand dollars, and then you got to take off forty uh, percent on taxes, agent fees, management fees, whatever that might be. So there's a uh, on-camera performers here. This is still for interactive, nine hundred and fifty-six dollars. So that's kind of the top of the top of the line there. Television dramatic rates. The television agreement for wages for these years for a day performer is one thousand eighty-two dollars. Weekly performer, $3,746. Major role performers for a half-hour program is $5,951. One-hour programs is $9,522. That's for the eight days, based on eight days. We're going to go to the ultra-low budget first, then the moderate-low budget, short project, 
and then theatrical. There's so many various different versions of the theatrical contracts because people in SAG, you can basically have a different agreement depending upon what the ramifications of your project are. And if you are doing like a modified low budget, it could be anywhere from like these. These are not pulling up, but you're going to you can check these out on your own. I'm sorry. I thought I could make this more concise, but it can range anywhere from one hundred dollars a day to two hundred and fifty dollars a day to a thousand dollars a day. OK, Don't fact check me here. I was trying to do my diligence here to find these in a good time, but I want to make sure you guys get more information here. These things can pay you, like I said, one hundred dollars to a thousand dollars per day. And unless you are doing that consistently, compare that to somebody who's making like, uh, you know, a teacher salary. What is any twenty five thousand to fifty thousand dollars a year? Right. Some debatable between there. And what is it? What is like the living wage at this point? I think they say like the household is like minimum sixty thousand dollars for like a a, a, a a living household wage. If you are working, you make four thousand dollars on a project and you work 10 projects for the year. You're making $40,000, right? On 10 huge projects, mind you, in the voiceover world. Um, And then you still got to take your taxes and everything out and make sure you're accounting for any of that stuff, paying your car bill, all these different things. It's it's uh, commercials. They're not paying the way that they used to. Where if you if you booked a national, you'd pay like you could make fifty thousand dollars. It's just not the same with YouTube anymore, and the way things are done on the internet, and with Netflix especially too. The way residuals are being paid, the money in the entertainment industry is not what it used to be even ten years prior. Things are paying way less. And a lot of these contracts, specifically voiceover, are still very much kind of, um, I don't want to say that they are inadequate, but they are still in their infancy because a lot of them haven't been touched for years. And each time that they make an adjustment, each time that they add um, a new kind of stipulation, like we just got coverage for... Uh, vocally intensive sessions that they can only do a maximum amount of time and they have to pay an extra percentage. Like these things are all brand new. So we're even talking a comparison of union versus non-union. And you might be saying, why doesn't every production just go union then? And why doesn't the union just make these things fair and safe so everybody can have a paying wage? Because if things become too out of proportion based on where they used to be, a lot of these companies will just opt to go non-union because they don't want to be held to these financial standards that they may not be able to provide for because of their budgets. So it, it, it's a threatening thing to drastically change these contracts because then more companies will stop using those contracts. They'll be incentivized to go non-union because they won't be held as accountable for any of these things that they may not want to pay for, like vocally stressful sessions. The same thing goes for uh, you know movies. A lot of independent films aren't going to go union because they can't afford to pay for the certain standards like per hour, overtimes, things like that. Like if you do an indie film, they're not paying you for overtime. They are not going to be giving you any sort of like per diem unless you're doing some sort of star contract where even then if you're not in union, I'd have to imagine you're like some sort of internet celebrity where you haven't joined the union yet and you're able to do a non-union contract. So what I'm trying to really explain is that it's a very few amount of people in the industry, because if you look at the industry as a whole, there's a lot of journeymen and people who are just kind of like these um, people you see on TV shows and movies, but you don't necessarily know their name. You know, I'm I'm not even going to say household name because there's a lot of people who aren't household names that uh, are working and making really good money because there's so much content now, but the large percentage of the industry, whether it's an actor, voice actor, um, commercial actor, um, any of the various singers, you know, uh, models, like you're not making a hundred thousand dollars. Um, even if you're working consistently, like I'm a working, consistently working person. And again, I'm tremendous amount of bills. I'm not making that kind of, you know, ludicrous amount of money that people expect It is still extremely competitive for me to pay my bills. Everything that I have, I am fighting every year to make sure that I can do what I can to find more leads for jobs and to make myself more bookable and to remind people that I'm around. 
So what are some of the different things that you can do if you're pursuing an artistic career and still make enough money so you can live comfortably and not have to abandon the thing that you're pursuing? Because this applies to all art forms, you know, animators, uh, people doing, you know, drawing and any sort of art form, dancers, singers, actors, movie producers, directors. What are the things that you can do to make money? Well, I gave you a huge amount of examples of the things that I've done. But I still think it's very viable to look within your industry and see where you might be a good fit and potentially have some sort of sort of orbiting around the thing you want to do. So, if you're an actor and you can work in an agency or a casting office or be start off as a PA in a movie lot, you may not be doing the thing that you are ultimately pursuing, but you're surrounding yourself with a bunch of people who are doing the same thing. So you're expanding your network and you're expanding your knowledge of the thing that you're pursuing. So if you're working behind the scenes on movies, say you're, you know, an assistant to the sound operator, whatever it might be, you're still getting to watch great actors perform and directors and producers. You can work at a studio. If if you have the skill set to to work as an engineer's assistant, um, or even the front desk of a studio, you're seeing these people walk in and out, and they're getting to know your face every day. If they're doing casting in house, they're getting to know you each day. It's not to say necessarily these people are going to think of you like to say, yeah, you're working here as this, and now we're ready to promote you into what you're pursuing. But the energy of being around it also helps fuel your artistic fire and passion and tenacity to continue doing it. Seeing the people who are doing it at the level that you wish to would be really inspiring. So you can work within the casting offices, at the studios, the networks, the production offices. You know, a lot of these film companies have production studios like Awesomeness TV, whatever it might be, and you can see if you can work in within those studios. And finding a skill set that you have that would put you in demand As actors, as performers, as artists, we can make ourselves extremely viable to a lot of companies because we got to know Photoshop, we got to know editing, we got to know, you know, how to use Adobe, whatever it might be. We have a large set of skill sets. We got to make resumes. So we know how to use Microsoft Word. We know how to use, you know, the Adobe suite or whatever version of it that you might know. So if you have been really competitive in the way that you pursue your business and you treat yourself as the CEO of whatever art field that you're pursuing, then you probably have a skill set that would be great within one of these companies. And there is the possibility to work your way up. A lot of PAs move into being writers or working as a producer, associate producer, eventually co-producer, executive producer. And you're surrounding by yourself with people who can help you get those jobs. I know so many friends who started off as PAs and then they wound up becoming writers on shows. I've seen it countless times. Is It was something I was considering doing before I had made my own business. So that's the other route, which takes more time. And you have to really sit down with yourself financially and assess like, okay, How much time do I have to be able to kind of like invest in a, uh, an entrepreneurial business and, and, or do I need this right now? If you need to make money now and you need to figure out a job and you know, maybe you've even been pursuing on LinkedIn or monster or indeed some of these really competitive jobs and you have to look elsewhere. There's, there's nothing wrong with getting a job waitering or catering working within the restaurant industry, because especially if you're in LA or New York, more so LA, the people you're surrounding yourself with are probably also pursuing, there's probably some people who are also pursuing that as well. And these could become collaborators, friends, people you network with, you start a web series with, you uh, start a, a voiceover group. Just keep putting yourself around people, people who are doing a similar thing, And it's kind of like the rising tide raises all ships thing. There's nothing worse than, I think, sitting in your insular bubble, not really being happy with a job that you have, and you're not surrounded, excuse me, you're not surrounding yourself with anybody who's doing a similar thing. 
If you've got a work from home job, maybe you're doing data entry or, or something like that, and you're making a lot of money, and that's giving you the freedom to pursue things in your off time, like take classes and invest in your career that you're pursuing, then great. If you are unhappy with that work from home data entry job that's not in the industry, then it might you might have to weigh the pros and cons of taking that job. You know, you might have to, it might be more worth it to take a little less money, but to surround yourself with people that you, you might enjoy being around and it's fueling your passion, like in the casting office or, you know, working on the lot, whatever it might be. I know it's a really competitive time searching for a job. I am not blind to that. I've seen it with friends of mine, people who now more than ever, I've seen people who have been pursuing this leave the entertainment industry because they just, they didn't want to do it anymore. They didn't want to like play the game of like, am I going to make my bills? Can I, you know, go out to eat at night? They wanted more security. I've seen that now more than ever. And even in their pursuit of outside of the industry, they're like, it's still freaking hard. So I really empathize with people and I'm not blind to that. But for me, I know that if I were to look at myself 10 years ago and I didn't have the opportunity that I did to make my own business, I would be working in the industry trying to find the people who are doing the things that I want to do and staying as close to them as possible, you know, be able to make the best cup of coffee, be able to do... um above and beyond what the job might expect if I'm working within the the industry. It's it's very uh, uh, deceiving. It's very deceiving when you see the celebrities in the top of the top making a killing at what they do and you think, you know, once you book your first series uh, that you think you're going to be on your way. It's just not really the case. You're not going to be making insane bucks and if that job ends... You're unemployed, and it's a scary place to be. And a lot of actors will go on unemployment if they're lucky enough and able to. But not everybody is able to collect unemployment. And then when you're looking for that next job, you are like, well, you know, I I, I, I thought I was killing it now that I have this series, but now the series is over, now I don't have a job, and you got to spend all that time looking for the job. I think it's a very smart idea to create a financial safety net if you're going to eventually quit that job to pursue your artistic career full-time. And even then, I don't recommend quitting your job until you're making enough money within that industry to say, yeah, if if I quit this other job, I'd be okay with where I'm making this out like on an average per year, you know? Because for me, I don't have a, a job outside of voice acting because I've committed so far at such a high level that I'm working enough, but the pay is just not equating to what some of my life expenses are. Granted, this also has to deal with medical bills, debt, student loans. It's different for everybody. Somebody else might be living very comfortably off of what I'm making. But for me, because I've had to accrue the, that debt to get where I am, I need all the time that I can to invest to level up even within where I'm at right now. And hopefully hopefully union rates will change, specifically in the voiceover industry. I mean, we've talked about this a bunch of times. The non-union rates for dubbing are... They, they're, they are still at $75 an hour for a lot of people at a lot of places. And you might be thinking that's a lot, but two hours, it's $150. You do that once uh, a month. 150 times 12, I'm not good at math, but you can do that yourself and you'll realize it's not a lot of money. So if you're not that person who's booking the lead role every time, then you're you're making below minimum wage at the end of the year, you know? It's so deceiving the way that the voice actor and actor has to portray themselves in the real world because we have to seem like we are these celebrities to a degree. Because you go to these conventions and people come to meet you and they're looking at you like you are this idol. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be even be in that situation and you're like, I'm probably making less money than you. <laughs> That's why a lot of voice actors are going to these conventions. Obviously, the fan interaction is great. And meeting all these people who love your work is like, I, I, I would do it for free. I was going to conventions. I love conventions. 
but it's it's also a way for us to supplement income that is not being present in a lot of these contracts yet, but hopefully that'll change in time. I want to give a realistic view of what this industry is like specifically on my end. And I know a lot of artists too in the animation world. I mean, you've seen the countless amount of um, articles and stories about these tremendously huge studios racing to finish something. And, um, you know, a lot of animators, people who are in graphic design are not getting paid great and they're being way overworked. That's not even something I can probably fathom because... There's never a situation where I would put myself in where I'd work, you know. There's only so much my body can do, and I'm sure that goes the same for a lot of you artists in other fields. But people are exploiting that as well, and that's why unions are really helpful when they are helpful, and they're protecting people. But it's very hard to be a union actor right now. A lot of people are not making enough money solely on union contracts alone, and there's a, a lot of people doing great work to to talk with the union and, and really give them a, a realistic view about what it's like to be a working performer um, and the realistic possibility of only doing union jobs. I think that there is a conversation that I'm not equipped to um, talk about where what is the reality of how much money you need to make to acquire insurance like the, the these numbers have increased over the years and um i really hope to see more change and aggressive work and talks from the people who are doing stuff for the union because um this is a really hard career to to do and only exist on union work i think too surviving as an actor or as an artist as i'm putting it here it goes way beyond your financial income and the things that you're doing for money. Surviving to me, it also has to do with having your head on right and finding things like maybe um, if you don't have insurance or if you're paying out of pocket, things like better help. Um, this is not a sponsored ad, but you know ways that you can speak to somebody that is not a tremendously huge financial investment. And you could do it from the comfort of your home. You don't have to drive somewhere and, and pay those expenses. But talking to somebody is extremely important. And I wish I had done it sooner. I wish I had done it sooner. If you don't know how to manage your emotions in high stressful situations, you're more than likely compensating or you are being insufficient in things that are very important for you, like job opportunities, interviews, auditions, if you're dealing with a lot of stress in your real life, it's hard to just leave that at the door. That's what therapy is great for, having someone in your corner to talk to about these things. Surviving also means having a household that is healthy and safe, um, roommates you can trust. Living with people is a very big step in a, step in a lot of people's lives. And creating clear boundaries with the people you live with as well is up there and one of the most important things I could ever, ever, ever talk about. I've had so many nightmarish roommate com com uh, uh, situations, and it's because I was not clear and communicative about how I like to cohabitate, uh, cohabitat? Yeah, cohabitat, right? Cohabitat, <laughs> where, where I like to live with people. I wasn't clear about the things that I like, you know, taking your shoes off at the door or not leaving food out and open, cleaning the sink, you know, making sure your laundry is whatever it might be. These little things that are probably small in in uh, in the grand scheme of things. But when you're living with someone and it's a day to day occurrence and it's where you're supposed to be feeling your most at home and most at peace and one with yourself, these things can just like slowly build up to the snowball. Or set off triggers that you you don't want to have have um, when you're in your own high stressful career life and personal life. Finding roommates who understand this about you and you guys understand your own temperaments as well, that's huge. And uh, it also can help with your expenses in life to have roommates. You know, so really having a clear set of rules and contracts between you, whether verbal or actually on paper, which I actually really do recommend because I think um, in everything I do in life, I like to have something written down to what was agreed upon. 
So if there's ever a dispute about something, you have a paper trail of saying, well, this is what we agreed upon. So if we're not agreeing upon this, maybe we've reached, we need to reevaluate this uh, agreement that we're dealing with. So who you live with is extremely important. Your mental health, who you live with, and really the things that you are able to surround yourself with. So like for me, plants has been a really big thing. Having morning music, um, paintings that, you know, I'm not going out and buying a Dali or anything like that, but just imagery and artwork that inspires me as an artist. So that when, I, when I'm in my home and in my temple, I'm, I'm constantly looking at certain things that remind me of the things that make me happy, the things that inspire me to work harder, that um, are really surrounding the ethos of who I want to be as a human being and the impact I want to have in the world. So seeing things, hearing things, and breathing what I, I prescribe my values to be. So I, again, don't want to discourage anybody about the life of an artist and the trials and tribulations that you might experience, especially living in one of the bigger cities. That's why for a lot of people, I recommend checking out a smaller city first if you've never lived in a big city on your own or even with roommates. You can check out Atlanta. You could check out Buffalo. You can check out Boston, Chicago. Those are big, but they're smaller in comparison and uh, I believe less uh, expensive than New York or LA. I think New York and LA are two of the most expensive places in the United States. But you can check out a smaller city and work within a smaller um, hub if they're they're doing things that you are aspiring to do and really understanding when it's right for you to move to that big hub to make that financial commitment to um, say, yeah, this is, this is worth it for me right now. I feel competitive and I'm, I know where I'm at and I, and I need to be at this place to uh, expand my network and professional contacts. Voiceover wise, ton of people killing it from home. So that's, something really to consider in the voiceover world. Obviously, other jobs, you got to go to the job. But voiceover is a very particular industry where I think a lot of people are killing it. Um, Tons of people I know that don't live in LA and New York, and they're working on some really big jobs. I see them on the cast lists. It is one of the most rewarding jobs you can ever have, doing what you love, creating art, um, telling stories that move and change people. But I I really wish that when I was starting out, I understood the ramifications of the the pay. Look at these contracts. If you're in another union, um, check out your union. There's so many different contracts for actors. Like I said, there's probably like 10 within just movies alone. So I really hope that you, if you're pursuing this career, you understand it is hard. It is very, very, very hard, the career of an artist. But at the end of the day, you know that you need to do this. It's in your DNA, that it's a part of who you are. The art form will exist whether you're getting paid or not. But obviously, we as artists want to get paid fairly. And understanding what a fair rate is is very important as well. Uh, If you're non-union in voiceover, check out the GVAA Rate Guide. The Global Voice Acting Academy, I believe is what it is. They have a rate guide that you could reference for things like audiobooks, commercials. There's a standard. So if especially you're working in the non-union world, you want to make sure that you're adhering to what a standard might be in place so that these companies know that they can't take advantage of people who are willing to accept less and drive the costs down instead of driving them up. If you respect what you do and you have something that is competitive and worth worth hiring, be firm in what you want to get paid. I think a lot of us are not confident that we are worth what we want to get paid, and we are. If you're good at what you do, you should get paid a fair wage and not get exploited. In the union world, again, refer to these contracts Make sure that you are um, getting what is paid right to you. Go over your contracts with your agents or managers. Sometimes things are weird or or fishy and um, there might be percentages of things that you're not supposed to be getting. Like in the on-camera world, you can get paid for 
bringing your own wardrobe or for pickups, if it's a voiceover thing, if the, the client's communicating directly with you instead of your agent or your manager or the casting office or production, you might be entitled to be getting paid for a lot of things that you might not know about. So have a team that you trust to help you or friends that are in a similar position as you and make sure you're getting paid a fair, a, a fair wage, a fair wage. That's all I really got for you guys. Um, I would do this career if it was unpaid. I would. I love it that much. And I think that's what drives me to work harder and to do more because I want to get paid for it. (laughs) I want to work at the highest level with the best people. And if they're getting paid good money, I would like to be too. Not a celebrity. I'm not some sort of rich person who's sitting on a bag of money and is uh, part of an elite class of people who is, you know, in a different tax bracket. It's not the case, at least for me and for most of my peers, it's not the case. Even once you've made a good living as an artist, I highly recommend people talk to um, financial advisors figuring out ways to invest your money so that your money can work for you. And even having a great accountant who can help you save money, especially if you're working freelance. There's various different um, ways you can classify yourself as a business, whether that's an LLC, um, an S-Corp, and all these different things have different... uh, classifications of how you can save money. I'm not an accountant. I'm not going to pretend to know what I'm talking about. I just know some of them are good and some of them are better depending upon what you do. A lot to look into. And it's a very comprehensive uh, career that they don't give you all the information for when you go to a a school. (laughs) But I wish you all the best of luck. I hope this encourages you to take your career into your own hands and know that it's okay that if you're making any sort of a living doing this, or even if you haven't been there yet and you're um, beginning to look at paying jobs, that you're doing a great job, that it is hard. And there's not something wrong with you if you're not able to sustain yourself only through your art alone. It is very hard. And kudos to you if you're making any money doing this. It is one of the most competitive industries in the world with some of the lowest paying jobs at the entry level. I don't know if that's true, but it sounds real true. It felt true for me when I look at comparisons to the people I know. Take what I say with a grain of salt. Do your own research. Love what you do. And find ways to keep your art in your life if you are experiencing hesitation or doubt. That's my advice to you all. I really hope that this has been beneficial and helpful. And do all that good stuff for us by sharing this, liking, subscribing, and all the notifications on so that other people can also be helped. I'm not getting paid for this, but I knew that if this was me younger 10 years ago, I would love to be hearing this sort of information. Thank you all. Have a great day, and we'll see you on the next one.